this dinky little thing is a dusk sensor. Let me zoom down it. And this was sent by Dave and he got it in a bulkhead light fitting from a UK supplier called Tool Station that supplies trade materials. And it was a very basic dusk sensor and he said that as the light transitioned to dusk, this started flickering horribly. And he went and looked at the reviews and they said the only solution is to get the three-wire dusk sensor and replace it. But he sent this one so we could explore it. And the first thing I'm noticing here is it's held together by sticky tape. It's literally got a label that's been folded around it to hold the case together. That's quite odd. But having said that, this is inside an enclosure. So tell you what we'll do. I shall zoom back out again. I shall bring in a light bulb, a low power light bulb. I've got the little Chinese test unit here. I've got a socket here and we can use this suitably trashy Chinese uh, Wago clone or Vago clone if we want to pronounce it correctly. So I shall hook this in line in series with that socket. I shall put this into this connector, noting that this is off at the moment. The display stays lit all the time. I should really add an indicator light to tell me when this is on, just as a reminder. It would make sense to avoid nasty tingles. But I'm going to, the, uh, that stuck in, I definitely put that into the connector well, didn't I? What did I do there? Did I not push it in far enough? You get over complacent with these things. <sighs> I guess it's the fact it's soldered and it's just not not gripping onto that well. Mmm. The other one seems in tightly. Makes mental note. Don't put soldered wires, because this came soldered, into the Vago type connector. Maybe the real Vago would actually work better. So let's screw this in. I'm leaving it in the box because. I think I'm leaving it in the box because I want to shield the sensor from the light itself. There we go. It is It is now attached. So I'll point that in that direction. Here's the light sensor. I'm going to have to turn the light off for this and I will warn you in advance that this may get flickery. So I'm just going to set the lighting up right now. One moment, please. Okay, it is now detecting that it is dusk and I've got a LED flashlight here. I'm going to shield it and I'm just gently going to pan it around to the point that it just barely and... Yeah, you can see it actually visibly shimmering and flickering at this sort of low light level that it's just neither fully on or off. That is very... That's very indecisive. It's not a snap action. It's literally trying to dim it up. That is not working very well, is it? Okay, that's excellent. That's exactly what we want. Okay, uh, tell you what, I'll pop this open, I'll take a picture and reverse engineer it, and we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. It is not sophisticated. The black sticker that I thought was holding the case together, I think it, although it will have had some effect on holding it together, I think it was mainly to shield it from light, because they have used a clear plastic case so that the pip for the light sensor can be the same plastic but as a result of that it can get light in from the back and that will affect its stability at night uh, on the circuit board i'll zoom down this on the circuit board we have a discrete bridge rect far made from four diodes Across that is a little thyristor under here. I'm going to guess it's an MCR100, which is a very sensitive uh, thyristor. And this blob of silicon here, they've made a little aluminium heat sink that folds around that. I think it's aluminium. And they've sort of glued it on. But they've also glued it onto the capacitor. This is the bit that's going to get hot with traditional tungsten lamps. And there it is glued onto the electrolytic. That's not going to extend its life much, is it? Uh, there is a current limiting resistor here, 470k. There's a, a voltage clamping Zener diode here. I measured just over 8 volts, so 8.2 volts is standard value. 100k in series with the uh, LDR, light dependent resistor. And that is it. I shall let you feast your eyes upon the schematic here, well, the circuit board. And I shall bring in the schematic and we can explore its simplicity and why it's so unstable. Here's the incoming supply. It goes via the lamp or bulb or globe or whatever you want to say. I've drawn the old retro tungsten one since that's probably what that circuit was really intended for. Goes to a bridge rectifier and the way the lamp is switched on is with this thyristor here shunting out this bridge rectifier. So when this gets triggered in each half wave, it turns on, current flows 
through the diodes in here, through the thyristor, keeping it latched on until it get, reaches the next zero crossing point, it turns off, and then gets triggered again. I say the zero crossing point, well, in a sense, it is the zero crossing point, but keep in mind, this is a humpy DC. It's full wave rectified um, AC into just basically unsmooth DC. There is the current limiting resistor up there, 470 k quite high value, and there is the Zener diode that gives a fairly stable-ish voltage here. Uh, there is a potential divider, 100k resistor, and the LDR, the light dependent resistor, probably cadmium sulfide. And it then just goes over to the gate of that thyristor with a little 0.47 microfarad capacitor, which is probably just to add at least some element of stability. Uh, and that uh, turns the thyristor on when the light level is at the correct level. And what that means is that during daylight, the current will be flowing through here and the voltage in here will be low because the resistance of this is low. But when it gets dark and the resistance of that is high enough, the current then chooses to, well, the voltage then reaches the threshold at which can trigger the thyristor. That is it. It's very simple. There's no hysteresis, which is the main problem here. The circuitry reminds me a lot of the very basic uh, children's nightlights that just had even less, they literally had one diode. Uh, and then the thyristor and it just drove the lamp half wave. But there it is. That is why it was flickery, not ideal for electronic loads. And even while it's turning on and uh, getting unstable at night, that's going to result in a bit of electrical noise from switching tungsten lamps, not tungsten lamps I use much these days. But they will go through a stage that it is probably triggering sort of kind of half wave-ish Actually, I suppose the Zener diode is there to actually stop that. It's going to cap the voltage from uh, going up to the sort of, multi sort of midpoint of the sine wave. Um, but uh, certainly it's going to be creating a little bit of noise when it turns on. And it's going to be doing that flickery thing. Fortunately, this Zener probably actually does ensure that uh, it's more likely to stay... The switch on point is going to stay fairly close to the zero crossing point, which is pretty good. Uh, but there we go. A very, very basic circuit. I didn't draw my usual diode in here. I've drawn it now. That's for the bridge direct far. Uh, a very standard approach. You, you'd wonder why they didn't just use a track. Uh, thyristors are more sensitive. This one probably is a gate current of like 40 microamps or something like that. And it's just a very simple way of controlling uh, loads with the bridge direct far and shunting it with the thyristor. So an interesting circuit. Not ideal for modern LED lamps, but will actually kind of work if you don't mind that slight shimmer at the dawn, well, at the start of dusk.